Duel on Certus by Paul Anderson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Rato Duel on Certus by Paul Anderson The night whispered the message. Over the many miles of loneliness that was born, carried on the wind, rustled by the half-sentient lichens and the dwarf trees, murmured from one to another of the little creatures that huddled under crags and caves by shadowy dunes, in no words but in a dim pulsing of dread which echoed through Krieger's brain, the warning ran. They are hunting again. Kriega shuddered in a sudden blast of wind. The night was enormous around him, above him, from the iron bitterness of the hills to the wheeling, glittering constellations light years over his head. He reached out with his trembling perceptions, tuning himself to the brush and the wind and the small burrowing things underfoot, letting the night speak to him. Alone, alone, there was not another Martian for a hundred miles of emptiness. There were only the tiny animals and the shivering brush and the thin, sad blowing of the wind. The voiceless scream of dying traveled through the brush from plant to plant, echoed by the fear pulses of the animals and the ringingly reflecting cliffs. They were curling, shriveling, and blackening as the rocket poured the glowing death down on them, and the withering veins and nerves cried to the stars. Krieger huddled against a tall, gaunt crag. His eyes were like yellow moons in the darkness, cold with terror and hate, and a slowly gathering resolution. Grimly he estimated that the death was being sprayed in a circle some ten miles across, and he was trapped in it, and soon the hunter would come after him. He looked up to the indifferent glitter of stars, and a shudder went along his body. Then he sat down and began to think. It had started a few days before in the private office of the trader Wisby. I came to Mars, said Reardon, to get me an owlie. Wisby had learned the value of a poker face. He peered across the rim of his glass at the other man, estimating him. Even in godforsaken holes like Port Armstrong one had heard of Reardon, heir to a million-dollar shipping firm which he himself had pyramided into a system-wide monster. He was equally well known as a big game hunter. From the fire drakes of Mercury to the ice crawlers of Pluto, he'd bagged them all, except, of course, a Martian. That particular game was forbidden now. He sprawled in his chair, big and strong and ruthless, still a young man. He dwarfed the unkempt room with his size and the hard-held dynamo strength in him, and his cold green gaze dominated the traitor. It's illegal, you know, said Wisby. It's a twenty-year sentence if you're caught at it. Bah! The Martian commissioner is at Ares, halfway around the planet. If we go at it right, who's ever to know? Reardon gulped at his drink. I'm well aware that in another year or so they'll have tightened up enough to make it impossible. This is the last chance for any man to get an owlie. That's why I'm here. Wisby hesitated, looking out the window. Port Armstrong was no more than a dusty huddle of domes, interconnected by tunnels, and a red waste of sand stretching to the near horizon. An earthman, in air-suit and transparent helmet, was walking down the street, and a couple of Martians were lounging against a wall. Otherwise, nothing. A silent, deadly monotony brooding under the shrunken sun. Life on Mars was not especially pleasant for a human. 
"'You're not falling into this owly loving that's corrupted all earth,' demanded Reardon contemptuously. "'Oh, no,' said Wisby. "'I keep them in their place around my post. "'But times are changing. It can't be helped.' "'There was a time when they were slaves,' said Reardon. "'Now those old women on earth want to give them the vote,' he snorted. "'Well, times are changing,' repeated Wisby mildly. When the first humans landed on Mars a hundred years ago, Earth had just gone through the hemispheric wars. The worst wars man had ever known. They damn near wrecked the old ideas of liberty and equality. People were suspicious and tough. They had to be, to survive. They weren't able to, to empathize the Martians, or whatever you call it, not able to think of them as anything but intelligent animals and Martians made such useful slaves. They need so little food or heat or oxygen. They can even live fifteen minutes or so without breathing at all, and the wild Martians made fine sport, intelligent game that could get away as often as not, or even manage to kill the hunter. I know, said Reardon. That's why I want to hunt one. It's no fun if the game doesn't have a chance. It's different now, went on Wisby. Earth has been at peace for a long time. The liberals have gotten the upper hand. Naturally, one of their first reforms was to end Martian slavery. Reardon swore. The forced repatriation of Martians working on a spaceships had cost him plenty. I haven't got time for your philosophizing, he said. If you can arrange for me to get a Martian, I'll make it worth your while. "'How much worth it?' asked Wisby. They haggled for a while before settling on a figure. Reardon had brought guns and a small rocket boat, but Wisby would have to supply radioactive material, a hawk, and a rock hound. Then he had to be paid for the risk of legal action, though that was small. The final price came high. "'Now, where do I get my Martian?' inquired Reardon. He gestured at the two in the street. Catch one of them and release him in the desert? It was Wisby's turn to be contemptuous. One of them? Ha! Town loungers! A city dweller from Earth would give you a better fight. The Martians didn't look impressive. They stood only some four feet high on skinny, claw-footed legs and the arms ending in bony forefingered hands were stringy. The chests were broad and deep, but the waists were ridiculously narrow. They were viviparous, warm-blooded, and suckled their young, but gray feathers covered their hides. The round, hook-beaked heads, with huge amber eyes and tufted feather ears, showed the origin of the name Owly. They wore only pouched belts and carried sheath knives. Even the liberals of earth weren't ready to allow the natives modern tools and weapons. There were too many old grudges. The Martians always were good fighters, said Reardon. They wiped out quite a few earth settlements in the old days. The wild ones, agreed Wisby, but not these. They're just stupid laborers as dependent on our civilization as we are. You want a real old-timer, and I know where one's to be found. He spread a map on the desk. See, here in the Hrefnian Hills, about a hundred miles from here, these Martians live a long time, maybe two centuries, and this fellow Kriga has been around since the first Earthmen came. He led a lot of Martian raids in the early days. But since the general amnesty and peace, he's lived all alone up there in one of the old ruined towers. A real old-time warrior who hates Earthman's guts. He comes here once in a while with furs and minerals to trade, so I know a little about him. Wisby's eyes gleamed savagely. He'll be doing us all a favor by shooting the arrogant bastard. He struts around here as if the place belonged to him and he'll give you a run for your money." Reardon's massive dark head nodded in satisfaction. 
If the man had a bird and a rock hound, that was bad. Without them, Kriega could lose himself in the labyrinth of caves and canyons and scrubby thickets, but the hound could follow his scent, and the bird could spot him from above. To make matters worse, the man had landed near Kriega's tower. The weapons were all there. Now he was cut off, unarmed and alone, save for what feeble help the desert life could give, unless he could double back to the place somehow. But meanwhile he had to survive. He sat in a cave, looking down past a tortured wilderness of sand and bush and wind-carved rock. Miles in the thin clear air to the glitter of metal where the rocket lay. The man was a tiny speck in the huge barren landscape, a lonely insect crawling under the deep blue sky. Even by day the stars glistened in the tenuous atmosphere. Weak, pallid sunlight spilled over rocks, tawny and ochreous and rust-red, over the low, dusty thorn bushes and the gnarled little trees, and the sand that blew faintly between them. Equatorial Mars Lonely or not, the man had a gun that could spang death clear to the horizon, and he had his beasts, and there would be a radio in the rocket boat for calling his fellows and the glowing death ringed them in, a charmed circle which Kriega could not cross without bringing a worse death on himself than the rifle would give. Or was there a worse death than that? To be shot by a monster and have his stuffed hide carried back as a trophy for fools to gape at? The old iron pride of his race rose in Kriega, hard and bitter and unrelenting. He didn't ask much of life these days. Solitude in his tower to think the long thoughts of a Martian, and create the small exquisite artworks which he loved, the company of his kind at the gathering season, grave ancient ceremony and acrid merriment, and the chance to beget and rear sons. An occasional trip to the earthling settling for the metal goods and the wine which were the only valuable things they had brought to Mars. A vague dream of raising his folk to a place where they could stand as equals before all the universe. No more. And now they would take even this from him. He rasped a curse on the humans and resumed his patient work, chipping a spearhead for what puny help it could give him. The brush rustled dryly in alarm. Tiny hidden animals squeaked their terror. The desert shouted to him of the monster that strode toward his cave. But he didn't have to flee right away. Reared and sprayed the heavy metal isotope in a ten-mile circle around the old tower. He did that by night, just in case patrol craft might be snooping around. But once he'd landed, he was safe. He could always claim to be peacefully exploring, hunting leapers or some such thing. The radioactive had a half-life of about four days, which meant that it would be unsafe to approach for some three weeks, two at the minimum. That was time enough, when the Martian was balked in so small an area. There was no danger that he would try to cross it. The Owlies had learned what radioactivity meant back when they fought the humans, and their vision, extending well into the ultraviolet, made it directly visible to them through its fluorescence, to say nothing of the wholly unhuman extra senses they had. No, Kriega would try to hide, and perhaps to fight, and eventually he'd be cornered. Still, there was no use taking chances. Reardon set a timer on the boat's radio. If he didn't come back within two weeks to turn it off, it would emit a signal which Wisby would hear, and he'd be rescued. He checked his other equipment. He had an air suit designed for Martian conditions, with a small pump operated by a power beam from the boat to compress the atmosphere sufficiently for him to breathe it. The same unit recovered enough water from his breath so that the weight of supplies for several days was, in Martian gravity, 
not too great for him to bear. He had a forty-five rifle built to shoot in Martian air that was heavy enough for his purposes, and, of course, compass and binoculars and sleeping bag. Pretty light equipment, but he preferred a minimum anyway. For ultimate emergencies there was the little tank of suspensine. By turning a valve he could release it into his air system. The gas didn't exactly induce suspended animation, but it paralyzed efferent nerves and slowed the overall metabolism to a point where a man could live for weeks on one lungful of air. It was useful in surgery and had saved the life of more than one interplanetary explorer whose oxygen system went awry. But Reardon didn't expect to have to use it. He certainly hoped he wouldn't. It would be tedious to lie fully conscious for days waiting for the automatic signal to call Wisby. He stepped out of the boat and locked it. No danger that the owlie would break in if he should double back. It would take toward night to crack that hull. He whistled to his animals. They were native beasts, long ago domesticated by the Martians and later by man. The rock hound was like a gaunt wolf, but huge breasted and feathered, a tracker as good as any terrestrial bloodhound. The hawk had less resemblance to its counterpart of earth. It was a bird of prey. But in the tenuous atmosphere it needed a six-foot wingsprit to lift its small body. Reardon was pleased with their training. The hound bayed, a low, quavering note which would have been muffled almost to inaudibility by the thin air and the man's plastic helmet, had the suit not included microphones and amplifiers. It circled, sniffing, while the hawk rose into the alien sky. Reardon did not look closely at the tower. It was a crumbling stump atop a rusty hill, unhuman and grotesque. Once, perhaps ten thousand years ago, the Martians had had a civilization of sorts, cities and agriculture and a Neolithic technology, but according to their own traditions they had achieved a union or symbiosis with the wildlife of the planet and had abandoned such mechanical aids as unnecessary. Reardon snorted. The hound bayed again. The noise seemed to hang eerily in the still, cold air, to shiver from cliff and crag and die reluctantly under the enormous silence. But it was a bugle call, a haughty challenge to a world grown old. Stand aside, make way. Here comes the conqueror. The animal suddenly loped forward. He had a scent. Reardon swung into a long, easy, low-gravity stride. His eyes gleamed like green ice. The hunt was begun. Breath sobbed in Krieger's lungs, hard and quick and raw. His legs felt weak and heavy and the thudding of his heart seemed to shake his whole body. Still he ran, while the frightful clamor rose behind him and the padding of feet grew ever nearer. Leaping, twisting, bounding from crack to crag, sliding down shaly ravines and slipping through clumps of trees, Kriega fled. The hound was behind him and the hawk soaring overhead. In a day and a night they'd driven him to this, running like a crazed leaper with death baying at his heels. He had not imagined a human could move so fast, or with such endurance. The desert fought for him. The plants with their queer, blind life that no earthling would ever understand were on his side. Their thorny branches twisted away as he darted through, and then came back to rake the flanks of the hound slow him, but they could not stop his brutal rush. He ripped past their strengthless clutching fingers and yammered on the trail of the Martian. The human was toiling a good mile behind, but showed no sign of tiring. Still Krieger ran, 
He had to reach the cliff edge before the hunter saw him through his rifle sights. Had to, had to, and the hound was snarling a yard behind him now. Up the long slope he went. The hawk fluttered, striking at him, seeking to lay beak and talons in his head. He battered at the creature with his spear and dodged around a tree. The tree snaked out a branch from which the hound rebounded, yelling till the rocks rang. The Martian burst onto the edge of the cliff. It fell sheer to the canyon floor, five hundred feet of iron-streaked rock tumbling into windy depths. Beyond the lowering sun glared in his eyes. He paused only an instant, etched black against the sky, a perfect shot if the human should come into view, and then he sprang over the edge. He had hoped the rock-hound would go shooting past, but the animal braked itself barely in time. Kriga went down the cliff face, clawing into every tiny crevice, shuddering as the age-worn rock crumbled under his fingers. The hawk swept close, hacking at him and screaming for its master. He couldn't fight it, not with every finger and toe needed to hang against shattering death, but— he slid along the face of the precipice into a gray-green clump of trees, and his nerves thrilled forth the appeal of the ancient symbiosis. The hawk swooped again, and he lay unmoving, rigid as if dead, until it cried out in shrill triumph and settled on his shoulder to pluck out his eyes. Then the vines stirred. They weren't strong, but their thorns sank into the flesh and it couldn't pull loose. Krieger toiled on down into the canyon while the vines pulled the hawk apart. Reardon loomed hugely against the darkening sky. He fired once, twice, the bullets humming wickedly close, but as the shadows swept up from the depths, the Martian was covered. The man turned up his speech amplifier, and his voice rolled and boomed monstrously through the gathering night, thunder such as dry Mars had not heard for millennia. Score one for you. But it isn't enough. I'll find you. The sun slipped below the horizon, and night came down like a falling curtain. Through the darkness Krieger heard the man laughing. The old rocks trembled with his laughter. Reardon was tired with the long chase and the niggling insufficiency of his oxygen supply. He wanted a smoke and hot food, and neither was to be had. Oh, well, he'd appreciate the luxuries of life all the more when he got home, with the Martian skin. He grinned as he made camp. The little fellow was a worthwhile quarry, that was for damn sure. He'd held off for two days now, in a little ten-mile circle of ground, and he'd even killed the hawk. But Reardon was close enough to him now so that the hound could follow his spoor, for Mars had no water courses to break a trail, so it didn't matter. He lay watching the splendid night of stars. It would get cold before long, unmercifully cold, but his sleeping bag was a good enough insulator to keep him warm with the help of solar energy stored during the day by its gurgan cells. Mars was dark at night, its moons of little help, Phobos, a hurtling speck, Deimos, merely a bright star, dark and cold and empty. The rock hound had burrowed into the loose sand nearby, but it would raise the alarm if the Martian should come sneaking near the camp. Not that that was likely. He'd have to find shelter somewhere, too, if he didn't want to freeze. The bushes and the trees and the little furtive animals whispered a word he could not hear, chattered and gossiped on the wind about the Martian, who kept himself warm with work. But he didn't understand that language, which was no language. Drowsily reared and thought of past hunts, 
the big game of earth, lion and tiger and elephant and buffalo and sheep on the high sun-blazing peaks of the Rockies, rainforests of Venus and the coughing roar of a many-legged swamp monster crashing through the trees to the place where he stood waiting. Primitive throb of drums in a hot, wet night, chant of beaters dancing around a fire, scramble along the hell plains of mercury with a swollen sun licking against his puny, insulating suit, the grandeur and desolation of Neptune's liquid gas swamps and the huge blind thing that screamed and blundered after him. But this was the loneliest and strangest and perhaps most dangerous hunt of all, and on that account the best. He had no malice toward the Martian. He respected the little being's courage, as he respected the bravery of the other animals he'd fought. Whatever trophy he brought home from this chase would be well earned. The fact that his success would have to be treated discreetly didn't matter. He hunted less for the glory of it, though he had to admit he didn't mind the publicity, than for love. His ancestors had fought under one name or another, Viking, Crusader, Mercenary, Rebel, Patriot, whatever was fashionable at the moment. Struggle was in his blood, and in these degenerate days there was little to struggle against save what he hunted. Well, tomorrow he drifted off to sleep. He woke in the short gray dawn, made a quick breakfast and whistled his hound to heel, his nostrils dilated with excitement, a high keen drunkenness that sang wonderfully within him. Today, maybe today. They had to take a roundabout way down into the canyon and the hound cast about for an hour before he picked up the scent. Then the deep-voiced cry rose again, and they were off, more slowly now, for it was a cruel, stony trail. The sun climbed high as they worked along the ancient riverbed. Its pale, chill light washed needle-sharp crags and fantastically painted cliffs, shale and sand and the wreck of geological ages. The low, harsh brush crunched under the man's feet, writhing and crackling its impotent protest. Otherwise it was still, a deep and taut and somehow waiting stillness. The hound shattered the quiet with an eager yelp and plunged forward. Hot scent! Reardon dashed after him, trampling through the dense bush, panting and swearing and grinning with excitement. Suddenly the brush opened underfoot. With a howl of dismay, the hound slid down the sloping wall of the pit it had covered. Reardon flung himself forward with tigerish swiftness, flat down on his belly, with one hand barely catching the animal's tail. The shock almost pulled him into the hole, too. He wrapped one arm around a bush that clawed at his helmet and pulled the hound back. Shaking, he peered into the trap. It had been well made, about twenty feet deep, with walls as straight and narrow as the sand would allow, and skillfully covered with brush. Planted in the bottom with three wicked-looking flint spears, had he been a shade less quick in his reactions, he would have lost the hound, and perhaps himself. He skinned his teeth in a wolf grin and looked around. The owly must have worked all night on it. Then he couldn't be far away, and he'd be very tired. As if to answer his thoughts, a boulder crashed down from the nearer cliff wall. It was a monster, but a falling object on Mars has less than half the acceleration it does on Earth. Reared and scrambled aside as it boomed into the place where he had been lying. Come on, he yelled, and plunged toward the cliff. For an instant a gray form loomed over the edge, hurled a spear at him. Reared and snapped a shot at it, and it vanished. The spear glanced off the tough fabric of his suit 
and he scrambled up a narrow ledge to the top of the precipice. The Martian was nowhere in sight, but a faint red trail led into the rugged hill country. Winged him, by God! The hound was slower in negotiating the shale-covered trail. His own feet were bleeding when he came up. Reardon cursed him, and they set out again. They followed the trail for a mile or two, and then it ended. Reardon looked around the wilderness of trees and needles, which blocked view in any direction. Obviously the owly had backtracked and climbed up one of those rocks, from which he could take a flying leap to some other point. But which one? Sweat, which he couldn't wipe off, ran down the man's face and body. He itched intolerably, and his lungs were raw from gasping at his dole of air but still he laughed in a gusty delight. What a chase! What a chase! Krieg lay in the shadow of a dark rock and shuddered with weariness. Beyond the shade the sunlight danced in what to him was a blinding, intolerable dazzle, hot and cruel and life-hungry, hard and bright as the metal of the conqueror's. It had been a mistake to spend priceless hours when he might have been resting, working on that trap. It hadn't worked, and he might have known that it wouldn't. And now he was hungry, and thirst was like a wild beast in his mouth and throat, and still they followed him. They weren't far behind now. All this day they had been dogging him. He'd never been more than half an hour ahead. No rest, no rest, a devil's hunt through a tormented wilderness of stone and sand, and now he could only wait for the battle with an iron burden of exhaustion laid on him. The wound in his side burned. It wasn't deep, but it had cost him blood and pain, and the few minutes of catnapping he might have snatched. For a moment the warrior Kriga was gone, and a lonely, frightened infant sobbed in the desert silence. Why can't they let me alone? A low, dusty green bush rattled. A sand runner piped in one of the ravines. They were getting close. Warily, Kriga scrambled up on top of the rock and crouched low. He had backtracked to it. They should, by rights, go past him toward his tower. He could see it from here, a low yellow ruin worn by the winds of millennia. There had only been time to dart in, snatch a bow and a few arrows and an axe. Pitiful weapons. The arrows could not penetrate the earthman suit when there was only a Martian's thin grasp to draw the bow and even with a steel head the axe was a small and feeble thing. But it was all he had. He and his few little allies of a desert which fought only to keep its solitude. Repatriated slaves had told him of the earthling's power. Their roaring machines filled the silence of their own deserts, gouged the quiet face of their own moon, shook the planets with a senseless fury of meaningless energy. They were the conquerors, and it never occurred to them that an ancient peace and stillness could be worth preserving. Well, he fitted an arrow to the string and crouched in the silent, flimmering sunlight, waiting. The hound came first, yelping and howling, Krieger drew the bow as far as he could, but the human had to come near first. There he came, running and bounding over the rocks, rifle in hand and restless eyes shining with taut green light, closing in for the death. Krieger swung softly around. The beast was beyond the rock now, the earth man almost below it. The bow twanged. With a savage thrill, Krieger saw the arrow go through the hound, saw the creature leap in the air and then roll over and over, 
howling and biting at the thing in its breast. Like a gray thunderbolt, the Martian launched himself off the rock, down at the human. If his axe could shatter that helmet! He struck the man, and they went down together. Wildly the Martian hewed. The axe glanced off the plastic. He hadn't had room for a swing. Reared and roared and lashed out with a fist. Retching Krieger rolled backwards. Reared and snapped a shot at him. Krieger turned and fled. The man got to one knee, sighting carefully on the gray form that streaked up the nearest slope. A little sand snake darted up the man's leg and wrapped about his wrist. Its small strength was just enough to pull the gun aside. The bullet screamed past Krieger's ear as he vanished into a cleft. He felt the thin death agony of the snake as the man pulled it loose and crushed it underfoot. Somewhat later he heard a dull boom echoing between the hills. The man had gotten explosive from his boat and blown up the tower. He had lost his axe and bow. Now he was utterly weaponless, without even a place to retire for a last stand. And the hunter would not give up. Even without his animals he would follow, more slowly but as relentlessly as before. Krieger collapsed on a shelf of rock. Dry sobbing racked his thin body, and the sunset wind cried with him. Presently he looked up, across a red and yellow immensity, to the low sun. Long shadows were creeping over the land, peace and stillness for a brief moment before the iron cold of night closed down. Somewhere the soft trill of a sand-runner echoed between low wind-worn cliffs, and the brush began to speak, whispering back and forth in its ancient, wordless tongue. The desert, the planet, and its wind and sand under the high cold stars, the clean open land of silence and loneliness and destiny which was not man's, spoke to him. The enormous oneness of life on Mars, drawn together against the cruel environment, stirred in his blood. As the sun went down and the stars blossomed forth in awesome frosty glory, Krieger began to think again. He did not hate his persecutor, but the grimness of Mars was in him. He fought the war of all which was old and primitive and lost in its own dreams against the alien and the desecrator. It was as ancient and pitiless as life, that war, and each battle won or lost meant something, even if no one ever heard of it. You do not fight alone, whispered the desert. You fight for all Mars, and we are with you. Something moved in the darkness. A tiny warm form running across his hand, a little feathered mouse-like thing that burrowed under the sand and lived its small fugitive life, and was glad in its own way of living. But it was a part of a world and Mars has no pity in its voice. Still, a tenderness was within Krieger's heart, and he whispered gently in the language that was not a language, You will do this for us? You will do it, little brother? Reardon was too tired to sleep well. He had lain awake for a long time, thinking, and that's not good for a man alone in the Martian hills. So now the rockhound was dead, too. It didn't matter. The owlie wouldn't escape, but somehow the incident brought home to him the immensity and the age and the loneliness of the desert. It whispered to him. The brush rustled and something wailed in darkness, and the wind blew with a wild, mournful sound over faintly starlit cliffs. 
and it was as if they all somehow had voice, as if the whole world muttered and threatened him in the night. Dimly he wondered if man would ever subdue Mars, if the human race had not finally run across something bigger than itself. But that was nonsense. Mars was old and worn out and barren, dreaming itself into slow death. The tramp of human feet, shouts of men, and roar of sky-storming rockets were waking it, but to a new destiny, to man's. When Ares lifted its hard spires above the hills of Sirtis, where then were the ancient gods of Mars? It was cold, and the cold deepened as the night wore on. The stars were fire and ice, glittering diamonds in the deep crystal dark. Now and then he could hear a faint snapping borne through the earth as rock or tree split open. The wind laid itself to rest. Sound froze to death. There was only the hard, clear starlight falling through space to shatter on the ground. Once something stirred. He woke from a restless sleep and saw a small thing skittering toward him. He groped for the rifle beside his sleeping bag, then laughed harshly. It was only a sand mouse, but it proved that the Martian had no chance of sneaking up on him while he rested. He didn't laugh again. The sound had echoed too hollowly in his helmet. With the clear, bitter dawn he was up. He wanted to get the hunt over with. He was dirty and unshaven inside the unit, sick of iron rations pushed through the airlock, stiff and sore with exertion. Lacking the hound which he'd had to shoot, tracking would be slow, but he didn't want to go back to Port Armstrong for another. No, hell take that Martian. He'd have the devil's skin soon. Breakfast and a little moving made him feel better. He looked with a practiced eye for the Martian's trail. There was sand and brush over everything. Even the rocks had a thin coating of their own erosion. The owl he couldn't cover his tracks perfectly. If he tried, it would slow him too much. Reardon fell into a steady jog. Noon found him on higher ground, rough hills with gaunt needles of rock reaching yards into the sky. He kept going, confident of his own ability to wear down the quarry. He'd run deer to earth back home day after day, until the animal's heart broke and it waited quivering for him to come. The trail looked clear and fresh now. He tensed with the knowledge that the Martian couldn't be far away. Too clear. Could this be bait for another trap? He hefted the rifle and proceeded more warily, but no, there wouldn't have been time. He mounted a high ridge and looked over the grim, fantastic landscape. Near the horizon he saw a blackened strip, the border of his radioactive barrier. The Martian couldn't go further, and if he doubled back, Reardon would have an excellent chance of spotting him. He tuned up his speaker and let his voice roar into the stillness. Come out, Owly. I'm going to get you. You might as well come out now and be done with it. The echoes took it up, flying back and forth between the naked crags, trembling and shivering under the brassy arch of sky. Come out, come out, come out. The Martians seemed to appear from thin air, a gray ghost rising out of the jumbled stones and standing poised not twenty feet away. For an instant the shock of it was too much, reared and gaped in disbelief. Krieg awaited, quivering ever so faintly, as if he were a mirage. Then the man shouted and lifted his rifle. Still the Martian stood there as if carved in gray stone. 
and with a shock of disappointment, Reardon thought that he had, after all, decided to give himself to an inevitable death. Well, it had been a good hunt. So long, whispered Reardon, and squeezed the trigger. Since the sand mouse had crawled into the barrel, the gun exploded. Reardon heard the roar and saw the barrel peel open like a rotten banana. He wasn't hurt, but as he staggered back from the shock, Krieger lunged at him. The Martian was four feet tall and skinny and weaponless, but he hit the earthling like a small tornado. His legs wrapped around the man's waist and his hands got to work on the air hose. Reardon went down under the impact. He snarled tigerishly and fastened his hands on the Martian's narrow throat. Kriega snapped futilely at him with his beak. They rolled over in a cloud of dust. The brush began to chatter excitedly. Reardon tried to break Kriega's neck. The Martian twisted away, bored in again. With a shock of horror, the man heard the hiss of escaping air as Krieger's beak and fingers finally worried the air hose loose. An automatic valve clamped shut, but there was no connection with the pump now. Reardon cursed and got his hands about the Martian's throat again. Then he simply lay there, squeezing, and not all Krieger's writhing and twistings could break that grip. Reardon smiled sleepily and held his hands in place. After five minutes or so, Krieger was still. Reardon kept right on throttling him for another five minutes just to make sure. Then he let go and fumbled at his back, trying to reach the pump. The air in his suit was hot and foul. He couldn't quite reach around to connect the hose to the pump. Poor design, he thought vaguely, but then these air suits weren't meant for battle armor. He looked at the slight, silent form of the Martian. A faint breeze ruffled the gray feathers. What a fighter the little guy had been. He'd be the pride of the trophy room back on Earth. Let's see now. He unrolled his sleeping bag and spread it carefully out. He'd never make it to the rocket with what air he had so it was necessary to let the suspense scene into his suit. But he'd have to get inside the bag, lest the nights freeze his blood solid. He crawled in, fastening the flaps carefully, and opened the valve on the suspense scene tank. Lucky he had it. But then a good hunter thinks of everything. He'd get awfully bored lying there till Wisby caught the signal in ten days or so and came to find him, but he'd last. It would be an experience to remember. In this dry air the Martian's skin would keep perfectly well. He felt the paralysis creep up on him, the waning of heartbeat and lung action. His senses and mind were still alive and he grew aware that complete relaxation has its unpleasant aspects. Oh well. He'd won. He'd killed the wiliest game with his own hands. Presently, Krieger sat up. He felt himself gingerly. There seemed to be a rib broken. Well, that could be fixed. He was still alive. He'd been choked for a good ten minutes but a Martian can last fifteen without air. He opened the sleeping bag and got Reardon's keys. Then he limped slowly back to the rocket. A day or two of experimentation taught him how to fly it. He'd go to his kinsman near Sirtis. Now that they had an earthly machine and earthly weapons to copy, but there was other business first. He didn't hate Reardon, but Mars is a hard world, 
He went back and dragged the earthling into a cave and hid him beyond all possibility of human search parties finding him. For a while he looked into the man's eyes. Horror stared dumbly back at him. He spoke slowly in halting English. For those you killed, and for being a stranger on a world that does not want you, and against the day when Mars is free, I leave you. Before departing, he got several oxygen tanks from the boat and hooked them into the man's air supply. That was quite a bit of air for one in suspended animation. Enough to keep him alive for a thousand years. End of Duel on Certus by Paul Anderson